If in this life only we had hoped in Christ, we are of all people most pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead and the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by men came death, by a man has come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom of God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. <coughs> the first sentence of our epistle text always gets me because it, it would seem as if Christians are to be pitied because of Christ. Uh, let, let, I'll read it again so you understand what, what I mean. If in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are all we are, we are of all people most to be pitied. So I ask the question, where's the emphasis? Again, in this life only we have hoped in Christ. We are of all people most to be pitied. And it's just a head scratcher of grammar, I think. You kind of wonder, well, what what is what is St. Paul trying to say here? Is he trying to say that if you hope in Christ, then you are to be pitied? Yeah, that's actually what he is saying. If you are to in this life, if you are to hope in Christ. You are to be the most pitied. People should pity you. But, here's the kicker. Christ is raised from the dead. You see, in, in this text, in that one sentence, if in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And so that's what makes it, makes all the difference in the world. The crucifixion and the resurrection is what makes Jesus Christ the Christ. Believe it or not, Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's a title. It's a messianic title. That is the one who would come to destroy death. And so if, if in this life we had hoped in any other false Christ, then we are to be pitied most of all. But the fact that Christ has been raised from the dead means that we are people not to be pitied, but that we, when Christ has brought all people to himself on the cross, and brought his disciples to the tomb and appears to them and says, Peace be with you. That when all of that happens, we are not to be pitied. We are to be reverent. We are to be brought to our knees and said, and say, I knew it. I believed and I knew it. And one day, you will see with your own eyes the words that I speak with to you today. With your own eyes, you shall see Christ. And then when Christ comes to judge living in the dead, who shall be pitied? Well, there will be a mingle, right? The sheep who are alive and the goats who are alive. The sheep who are dead and the goats who are dead. It doesn't mean that those who are alive are the good ones and the ones who are dead are the bad ones, but rather 
the ones in whom believe will be judged. And the judgment is this, innocent. When Christ comes to, again to judge the living and the dead, He does so only to judge His people. Because the judgment of the unbeliever has already been judged. And the judgment is this, hell. But make no mistake, God doesn't want to send people to hell. And you might not, you won't hear, hear very many pastors say that. But God doesn't want to send people to hell. God is, God is not this uh, divine chess master just playing and moving pawns around here and there and saying, well, this knight's going to hell and this bishop, well, he's going to hell too. And this, uh, this king here, he's going to heaven. And that's not how it works. People send themselves to hell by not believing in the Christ, not believing in the resurrection, and people go to their graves not believing. And so when that time comes, they will be like the rich man who looked up to Lazarus and says, if you just send someone to my brothers, then they will know the torment that I'm in and they will not come here. And it is said to the wise man, to the, to, the, to the rich man, they have the law and the prophets. You, dear sinners, whom I love, you have the law and the prophets. But you have one thing greater that they didn't have. You have the Gospels. You have the writings of St. Paul. You have the revelation of St. John. You have so many texts that early Christians simply did not have or had fragments of. And here we have it laid out all before us, the fact of this. If you believe in the Christ, you must believe in the resurrection of Christ. If you do that, if you do not, you cannot call yourself a Christian. I mean, you could call you that, but I'll call you a liar. And this is what really I find quite interesting because after that text in 19, that kind of looks like it hangs on by itself. Then we come to the word first fruits. And every time someone hears the word first fruits, they either clutch their purse or get ready to open it. But the truth is, first fruits is not necessarily stewardship. It is, but it's not merely stewardship. It means the first to be harvested. The first to be harvested off the vine. First fruits. The first to, as the vine grows, and you see the first grape on there, and you pluck it and you say, this is first, these are the first fruits, the sweetest and the greatest. Well, so is the fact that when Christ was raised from the dead, he was that first fruit that rose from the earth. First fruit from the dead. But here's the interesting part. If there's a first fruit, there will be a second, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, until every one seed who is buried in the ground, or every one seed who is living shall see Christ, the first fruits, and we will be as one. One body, one cup, 
one in which we drink from. And that is from Christ who is raised from the dead. The first fruit of all who have fallen asleep in Christ. For in Adam, we all die. And it is right that we do. But in Christ, or in, in Adam, we all die because Adam's great sin is not that Eve ate of the fruit. Adam's great sin was that he was not being the husband he should have been to his wife. He was not protecting his wife or else, as I say to the Wednesday class, he would have went out and got the hoe and he would have chased that snake away. But he was off doing something else. Not concerned about his wife. And so she fell. But the first sin was Adam's. And so from the first sin that is Adam's, so also the forgiveness of sins must come through one man. And that man is Jesus Christ. And by his death, he destroyed death. And by his living, he gives us hope of everlasting life and a resurrection of our own. Because of this, when Christ comes to judge the living and the dead, when it comes to the end, when Christ enters into his kingdom, when he delivers the kingdom of this world, the saints of this world, to the Father, he will do the one thing that and I'll repeat it. He will do the one thing that should have conquered him, but didn't. Christ, the destroyer of death. Imagine that. And it's hard for us to imagine because we use terms like scared to death or we bury loved ones and we are afraid of dying or at least the concept of the unknown, whatever it may be. But here we have the very last words that the last thing to be destroyed shall be death and that Christ is the one who destroys it. And the irony of all irony and ironies and the beauty of all beauties and the gorgeousness of that that is Christ is that He destroyed it by using it. He destroyed death by dying. And then by rising, death could not touch you. Though you die, yet shall you live. Thanks be to God for such a wonderful day as today. The Easter when we get to celebrate Christ's triumph over death and a resurrection of our Lord. The first fruits from the dead. Thanks be to God that we are the second fruits plucked from the vine made sweet by our Lord, washed in the waters of holy baptism. And Christ takes that fruit in which He has taken from the ground and He says, this fruit is my fruit. And just as many grapes make up one cup, so Christ makes up one church and our Lord drinks deeply. Amen.